Appalachia's biggest legend is by far the long hunter and frontiersman Daniel Boone. Born in Pennsylvania, he moved to the Yadkin River Valley as a teen and from there moved ever farther westward, in the process taking settlers with him, first to southwest Virginia, then on to Kentucky. Hello folks, I'm Steve Gelly, along with Rod Mullins, and you're listening to Stories, a history of Appalachia. We've reached part three of our Daniel Boone series, and I have to tell you, the first two chapters that we did of this podcast have been exciting, and Steve... I know that people are going to be wanting to find out what happened to Daniel Boone here in this third part because there's a lot of things that change from the first and the second parts that we've already recorded. That's true. And what happened was, first of all, the American Revolution ended. Secondly, Daniel Boone and his family again, yes, returned to Kentucky, settling this time in Maysville. Now, Daniel again ran for political office and was elected to the Virginia General Assembly as a representative from Bourbon County in 1787. Now, Boone's time in Maysville was probably, Rod, the most prosperous time of his life. Here he kept a tavern, worked as a horse trader, surveyor, and land speculator, eventually accumulating enough assets to buy seven slaves. And he became a national celebrity here, too, when on his 50th birthday in 1784, Historian John Filson published his book on the history of settlement in Kentucky, which prominently featured the role played by Daniel Boone. You know, we still have to tell people, you know, you mentioned in there at the beginning, Mm -hmm. Virginia General Assembly and Bourbon County in 1787. We need to remind folks that at one time, Virginia was a huge, huge territory. Oh, yeah. It went all the way from the Chesapeake Bay to the Mississippi River. And when I say Kentucky at this time... I'm really talking about the region of Kentucky. It's in 1787, five years before Kentucky becomes a state. Because some of these counties, and just to tell people, some of these counties that came up, Bourbon County and things, yes, they belong in Kentucky because, you know, you don't hear names like that in the Commonwealth of Virginia of some of the counties. But now in Kentucky, yes, that's where this was all taking place. But you got to remember, Virginia was a big territory then, up until the time that Kentucky became a state. But adventure still called. In the fall of 1786, Boone took part in a military expedition into the Ohio country as a part of the Northwest Indian War. Back home, he helped care for captured Shawnee and negotiated a truce and a prisoner exchange. With the end of the war after the American victory in the Battle of Fallen Timbers in 1794, Daniel Boone's days as a warrior were over, maybe. And the good times soon came to an end as well. Now, Boone began to have financial troubles, mainly because of his land speculation. You see, Boone wasn't just a land speculator. He was a big speculator, dealing in buying and selling claims to tens of thousands of acres. And with that speculation came a lot of unscrupulous people to be dealt with. Boone, though, had a sense of honor that made him reluctant to profit at someone else's expense. In other words, he was not ruthless enough for land speculation. Well, to get away from the legal troubles that came with his financial problems, Boone just kept on moving. In 1788, he moved to Point Pleasant, Virginia, now West Virginia, where he opened a trading post and worked as a surveyor. And when Virginia established the new county of Kanawha in 1789, Boone was, yes, appointed lieutenant colonel of the new county militia. Seems he gets that all the time wherever he moves to. And his love of politics continued when he was again elected to the Virginia General Assembly from Kanawha County in 1791 for the third time. Eventually, he wasn't able to buy goods for his trading post, though, due to his bad credit, so he closed it down and he went back to hunting and trapping. Well, Boone again moved with Rebecca to Kentucky in 1795 to Nicholas County to live on land owned by one of their sons. In 1796, he applied for the contract to widen his wilderness road into a good, solid wagon route, but the contract went to someone else, and the lawsuits continued. All of that land speculation that Boone was involved in over the years was now coming back to haunt him. The claims that he bought were all being challenged in the courts, and that meant lawyers. And Mm. lawyers mean money. And money, Daniel Boone, had in short supply. 
So he started selling off his remaining tracts of land to pay those fees and court costs, at least until he had nothing left, at which point he just started ignoring the court system. And, you know, that doesn't sit well with judges when they're presiding on the bench, does it, Steve? Uh, no, I can tell you from personal experience, <laughs> no, it does not. <laughs> And it didn't for Boone either, because in 1798, a warrant for the arrest of Daniel Boone was issued after Boone ignored a summons to appear and testify in a court case. But he managed to evade the sheriff who was looking to serve him. I guess all those years roaming the woods at least taught him how to do that. Ironically, that same year, the Kentucky General Assembly named Boone County in Daniel Boone's honor. Well, with all this... Daniel Boone had decided he'd had enough of the United States. In 1799, he took his family with him to the Louisiana Territory, then owned by Spain, to settle in what's now St. Charles County near St. Louis. The Spanish governor appointed Boone to be a judge of the territory and a commandant of the Femo Sage District, and he served in these capacities for the next four years. Well, guess what? By 1804, Spain had ceded the Louisiana Territory to France, which in turn sold it to the United States. So he wasn't a part of at least the Spanish part at that time. He was back in the United States at that point. So while Boone might have managed to get away from the United States, America, in a sense, came looking to bring him back. The Spanish land grants had all been verbal. So once again, Daniel Boone lost all of his land. Desperate, he petitioned Congress to have his Missouri land restored to him, which it did in 1814. And all was well, right? No, it wasn't because since Boone was once again on American soil, those old Kentucky debts came back to haunt him. His western land was all sold to repay those debts, leaving him landless after having led so many pioneers west to their own farms. Boone's last years were spent with his children and grandchildren in Missouri, and he continued doing what he loved to do, which was hunt and trap game, at least as often as an old man could. Now, according to one story, Rod, Boone took a hunting trip all the way to the Yellowstone River, the age of 85. According to a U.S. military officer at Fort Osage on the Missouri River, quote, "...we have been honored by a visit from Colonel Boone, the first settler of Kentucky." He lately spent two weeks with us. He left us for the River Platte, some distance above. Colonel Boone is 85 years of age, 5 feet 7 inches high, stoutly made, and active for one of his years, he is still a vigorous mind, and is pretty well informed. He's taken part in all the wars of America from before Braddock's War to the present hour. Now, think about that, Rod. Go on foot or on a horse, but be the only way you get there, from... Missouri, all the way out to the Yellowstone River when you're 85 years old. Wow. <laughs> Could you That's, do that, you think? I doubt it very seriously. I'm lucky if I can put my left foot in front of my right foot and be able to walk down the mall safely. <laughs> you know, he's he's he, he had to be quite a man for his age at 85. But, you know, Steve, time finally did catch up with this legend and the old long hunter when he died of... Get this, acute indigestion. Of course. <laughs> it couldn't I, be anything you know, else. I, I've just never heard that term before, acute indigestion. And he died on September 26, 1820, at the home of his son Nathan on the Fem Osage Creek in Missouri. His last words were, quote, I'm going now. My time has come. Now, he was buried at the old Bryan Farm graveyard next to Rebecca, who died seven years before. In 1845, the Boone's remains were disinterred and reburied in Frankfort Cemetery in Frankfort, Kentucky. Or were they? According to legend, Boone's remains are still in Missouri because his tombstone had been placed over the wrong grave. So the wrong remains were taken back to Kentucky and nobody had ever corrected the error. Now, Daniel Boone's descendants in Missouri, unpleased with the fact that Kentucky had wanted to move him in the first place, in light of him wanting to leave the state to begin with, kept quiet about that mistake. Well, in 1983, in an effort to settle the matter, a forensic anthropologist examined a plaster cast of Boone's skull made before he was reburied in Frankfurt. Rod, who would even think of doing such a thing? 
I don't know, but someone that was very desperate to probably prove something in order to settle this matter. So. I have no idea. But anyway, this anthropologist announced that the skull was possibly the skull of an African-American and not Boone. Mm -hmm. And that would kind of make sense and fit in with the legend since slaves were buried in that same cemetery. Today, both the Frankfurt Cemetery and the Old Bryan Farm Graveyard in Missouri claim to have Daniel Boone's earthly remains. Well, I mean, both of them to some degree can can state to some degree equally that they have the remains of Daniel Boone. Kentucky can lay claim to it, but Missouri also can lay claim to it. But in the end, does it really matter now? No, it doesn't. No. But still, you know, the legend of Daniel Boone, that's what the incredible thing is all about this. He was one of the most well-known people of Appalachia. Well, that's the story of Daniel Boone, the most well-known son of Appalachia, and one of the stories that make up this place we call home. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to subscribe to Stories, A History of Appalachia, just go to Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, or your favorite podcast app. We're on Facebook at Stories of Appalachia and on Twitter at Story Appalachia. Again, thanks for listening. Until next time, take care. So long, everybody.